Welcome in, What's Right with Nick Wright, episode 226. What a night of college hoops last night on the women's side of things. We have, I'm the great statistician from First Things First, Dusty, is about to text me the exact number. But oh. there is a chance that both the men's and the women's all-time single tournament scoring record goes down in this tournament. Zach Eady for Purdue, fresh off his 40-point performance, has scored 120 points through four tournament games. The all-time record for a single tournament is NBA Jam legend, flamethrower Glenn Rice, who had 184 points for Michigan 35 years ago in a NCAA tournament. So Edie needs to average 32 and a half points. He needs to obviously make the final and score 65 total points in his next two games. Caitlin Clark, I don't know what the women's record is. That's what Dusty's looking up for me right now. Caitlin Clark has 136 through four tournament games. She is averaging an incomprehensible 34, 7, and 10 through the tournament. And so if she can get past UConn and get to the final against South Carolina, I've got to imagine she's got a great chance at setting that record. So a wonderful night in women's basketball yesterday, a wonderful night in basketball in general. We will discuss that. I'm going to give young people some advice in relation to what Angel Reese said after the game. Also, folks really were mad at me, it would appear, for not discussing the Rasheed Rice situation on television yesterday. That is not a great television topic because there's not much to say with the information we have, but I'll discuss it here. We'll do all that, talk some NBA, play a game of likely maybe what if. But first, here's what missed the cut for today's show. A UFL kicker that reportedly hadn't kicked a field goal since high school hit a 64-yard game winner. Beyonce releasing a country album. Pretty good, actually. And the Chiefs signed Carson Wentz. Demonze, welcome in. Shades look great. I'm, I'm you, You're going to get your new designer shades when I see you in a week and a half. But in the meantime, okay. I like the rotation you're going through. Uh... The Chiefs sneakily, I think, might be listening to my old Cam Newton advice, which was I said they need to sign Cam specifically for goal line and QB sneak situations. Carson Wentz, great at those things. That might be what my guy Brett Veach is doing. And so Carson Wentz coming in to be a backup quarterback for the Chiefs. But, of course, the news last night, Demonze are the the lead eight games on the women's side of the bracket. So you go ahead. Yeah, so Caitlin Clark put on a clinic versus LSU last night. Got their revenge from last year. Uh Juju Watkins dropped twenty nine, but USC came up short and couldn't go uh couldn't kill cage buckets in UConn. You predicted that yep. last night will be the greatest night in women's history or women's hoop history. Sorry about that. How yeah, did that? How did last night? Women's night live? history. Would yeah, be. no, that's I, crazy. I'm not sure what <laughs> night that would be, uh, but I, but in women's basketball history. So yeah. here's the deal. Uh, yeah, it lived up to my expectations. Uh, UConn's better than USC. I understand USC. I shouldn't say that. USC at the higher seed. I'm not shocked that UConn won. And people should remember that Paige was. The best player in the sport, arguably, is a freshman. Like, Juju has the argument, at least aside from Caitlin Clark. And then Paige missed time because she got hurt. And now Paige is reminding everyone who she is. Now, Juju is... Maybe has the highest upside of any female player I've ever seen. And at her age and her skill set and her size, we'll see what she continues to do. Demanza, you got to see her in person. Uh, yeah. We didn't talk about it on the show, but I mean, she amazing is defender. A, an amazing defender. The right pass. Great. She's a good teammate. Seems a, like a, too. Right. I mean, she's, ex she's exceptional, but she'll have her time. And I'm glad that we're going to get Caitlin. It would have been awesome to get Caitlin against Juju, 
but Caitlin against Paige is pretty dope. And then sitting on the other side of the bracket is South Carolina, which is going to win the whole thing. They're, Just undefeated. they're undefeated. They're the, they, well, no, I mean, they've got the best coach in college basketball. They have the best roster in college basketball. They, the, I mean, South Carolina is the best team. It would take a more than what Caitlin did last night against LSU by Caitlin or Page to beat South Carolina. But either way, it's an unbelievable run for both these programs. But I want to talk about Caitlin. First, I do think, and I hate to start negative, but I will to a degree, I thought Kim Mulkey's game plan was perplexing. I thought just asking Haley Van Lith, dear up, was a curious decision that she didn't go away from. They didn't start blitzing her or put Flauge on her until the game was out of hand with four minutes left. And it'd be and it like Haley was it, like, correct. They took and Van Haley, Lith off her, she stopped scoring. Yes, and... Haley was struggling massively on the offensive end. So in theory, she, and Haley had a brutal tournament. I feel badly for her. She's the young lady that was at Louisville last year, had the little back and forth with Caitlin, and then transferred to LSU to be with a better team. And she listen, she shot 21% from the field in the tournament and 21% from three. It was a brutal tournament for her. Uh, but she, you can't ask anybody to just play – one-on-one -on -one man defense on Caitlin Clark. That's what Mulkey asked Haley Van Lith to do. And it was the, when you watched how she was playing offensively, the only way that made sense was, oh, okay, you're dealing with that because of what she's giving you defensively. But the poor lady was getting cooked defensively. Yeah. There's nothing anybody was going to be able to do against Caitlin last night. And that was a legendary performance by a legendary player. This is the team that beat you in the national championship game that you have had circled all year long that for some people, nothing that you do this year, I'm not one of those people, but for some people, was going to matter if you lose to them. And she had one of the best games of her career. 41-7-12 and with an impossible degree of difficulty on those shots just absolutely impossible degree of difficulty and so when you saw what she did now last year against South Carolina in the national semifinal she had and maybe even a more impressive uh shooting performance the where she hit no no actually the no, it wasn't a more impressive shooting performance. My apologies. She, she In that game, she actually struggled from three. But she had 41 in that game as well. But not as many assists. You could argue South Carolina was better. I don't know. Last year than LSU this year probably was. But I think given the opponent, given the stakes, and given the attention, it was the most impressive game of her career in... You can say it wasn't the biggest game of her career because she played for a national championship last year, and I understand that argument, but the revenge factor, and last year in the national championship, it was kind of a house money game. They weren't expected to be there. Caitlin didn't have these type of expectations. LSU was considered the better team. This year, you're the favorite. You are expected to be there. You're the one, all of those things. You got to win that game. Or a lot of people are going to find ways to be like, oh, how good is Caitlin Clark really? And she responded with arguably the greatest performance of her career. And those shots were just impossible, man. They're off balance, on the move, off the dribble. With some of them with good defense where you saw Angel and Haley both do the Michael Jordan shrug, like, what the hell do you want me to do? Like, what do you want me to do in this spot? And so I know there's going to be a discussion on, is she the greatest female basketball player ever? Here's my 
issue with that discussion. When it comes to talking about the greatest NBA players ever, I feel like I am able to accurately and intelligently discuss players that I never watched live because I have the ability to go back and watch almost anything from the 80s on. And so maybe I can't fairly evaluate Wilton Russell, but I can fairly evaluate, you know, more about half of Kareem's career, all of Magic, all of Bird, all of Michael, all of that. I, Cheryl Miller is probably the leading contender historically for the greatest female player ever. All I can do is watch clips and read her Wikipedia. Like, I can't. I I can't go back and watch her the way I could watch men's pro basketball of the same era. So, and obviously, the greatest players at Tennessee in the 90s and a long list of UConn women's Huskies over the last 20 years, from Tarazi to Brianna Stewart, all have a credible case. So, I don't know if Caitlin Clark's the greatest female basketball player ever my money would be on juju getting there um i do know this caitlin clark is revolutionary in the attention she has brought to the sport the eyeballs she has brought to the sport and the way she has risen to the occasion every time the spotlight's been on her she's like lady and People like three-pointers. Well, yes. And she plays a... She has a lot of stylistic similarities to Steph. All of these men's players who have come up trying to emulate Steph, she has succeeded more than any of them. Like, Trey Young takes a lot of the same shots Steph does, but you look at his shooting percentages, you look at his efficiency, it's not there. Her passing... Plus her off-the-bounce, off-balance, rain shooting. She is the closest to Steph. Off-ball movement as well, I feel like. Oh, that's a great point. What she does when she doesn't have the ball. Right, the constant movement, all of it. The relocating. uh, So, I do think last night was a uh, transcendent moment in women's sports history. Uh, and it brings me to what I wonder is going to happen with Caitlin Clark and the stars and the WNBA, because I sent Demonze a text Ooh. yesterday that seems, seems make believe what I sent him, but I'm going to read it to you directly from USA Today. Which is, right now, if you're listening, give it a guess what Caitlin Clark, as the number one pick of next year's WNBA draft, will make. So, just, you know, if you're, just come up with a number in your head. And this is not a conversation about that the WNBA players should make as much as NBA players. That is a facile conversation that nobody actually thinks is true and people who are on the other side of the argument prop it up as a straw man as if that is what you're arguing against. But when I tell you how much Caitlin Clark's going to make from the Indiana Fever next year when she's the number one pick, I promise you, whatever number you're guessing, you're far too high. So the number one pick, of last year's WNBA draft. And the, I'm going to, so it was Aaliyah Boston. I'm going to read you her exact salary. So again, this will go up by a tick. Aaliyah Boston got a three year, $230,000 contract. That is not per season, that is total. The number one pick of last year's WNBA draft, her salaries are as follows: seventy-four grand, seventy-six grand, 
83 grand and then a team option for $94,000. So that's what Caitlin Clark is going to make from the Indiana Fever next year. So there are a lot of elements to that and economics to it and how profitable is the league should the players get a larger share of the revenue pie as they do in the NBA, all of it. I don't actually care to have that conversation right now. The conversation I do care to have is this. If the NBA and the WNBA care about ensuring that they continue the momentum from the women's college game and don't have their stars going overseas to play as so many have most famously obviously Brittany Griner who then got locked up for a year plus uh, while playing in Russia but so many of the greats play overseas they have to find a way to make this make sense because people say well Caitlin's going to make so much money off endorsements She's going to make, however much she's going to make off endorsements is going to exist whether the W, whether she makes 75 grand or 750 grand in the WNBA, but the individual player max for the, the WNBA is a quarter of a million bucks and Caitlin Clark averaging 80 grand a year for the first three years of her career. That's not a sustainable business model. And there, somebody is going to see that and create a competing all-star league that is going to pay the actual stars that get developed in college basketball real money, and then the WNBA is cooked. The, if the, the WNBA Ice has a Cube chance a to use this, right, I exactly right. <laughs> what Ice Cube talked about or somebody, like the, the America loves stars. And we now have a bunch of female college stars. And I'm not saying you got they have to all make millions of dollars. But 80 grand a year for Caitlin Clark ain't gonna cut it, guys. Just yeah. not. And it also will create situations where if your team is paying you 80. And Nike's paying you a million. Who do you work for? You don't work for your team. You work for Nike. There are there there will be if your if your team is paying you eighty, and you're offered fifty to give a speech. Team's paying you eighty for the year, and you're offered fifty grand to give a speech that conflicts with something your team needs to do. Well, sorry guys, like there are real things that happen here, and so. That I th- th- that is something that the NBA and the WNBA need to figure out because you can't squander this moment. And we have seen in men's sports, when the NBA was not financially what it is now, the ABA takes advantage and gets stars. When the NFL was not financially what it is now, the USFL, Steve Young, Reggie White, Doug Flutie, Warren Moon, stars. You can't have the league's talent pool diluted. So I really, really hope that on the professional level, they take advantage of the fact that you are going to have over the next few years names coming into your league. Caitlin, Angel, Paige, Juju, all coming into your league that people will want to see. All right. Uh... With all that said, I think USC is going to win the whole thing. I, I'm sorry, USC. South Carolina is going to win the whole thing. They're also USC, oddly, University of South Carolina. But South Carolina is the best team. I also really like Dawn Staley. Uh, but that I – if Caitlin can pull this off, it'll be remarkable. Uh, but I I think South Carolina is too good. And Gabe is reminding us that is a fake USC. Well, they're both University of Southern California, University of South Carolina. You guys hash that out in court. All right, Demonze, uh, let's go to Angel yeah. Reese. Yeah, so after the game, Angel Reese had uh, had this to say in her presser for those watching on YouTube. I'm going to show up. Yeah. 
we're little, gonna show uh, it and, you, and I just try to stand strong like I've been through so much I've seen so much I've been attacked so many times death threats I've been sexualized I've been threatened I've been so many things and I've stood strong every single time and I just try to stand strong for my teammates because I don't want them to see me down and like not be there for them so I just want to always just know like I'm still a human like all this has happened since I won the national championship and I said the other day I haven't had peace since then and it sucks and but I still wouldn't change listen there's a lot that go goes into that uh a lot of the Angel Reese hate from a year ago was steeped in racism. There's obviously Kim Mulkey, who I'm not a fan of at all, but she was right in this regard. Some of the, a lot of this has been misogynistic. There's a lot of factors that that have led to that. Um, but that's actually not the discussion that I want to have here. The discussion I want to have here is a different one, and that is to particularly young people, but really people my age as well, but r particularly people age 15 to 25 are, are the ones I am speaking to most specifically here, but I think there are grown-ass people my age and older that could use this lesson as well. Everybody. Everybody, you got to stop reading the comments. You have to. People are not, human beings are not psychologically equipped to deal with a constant inflow of attacks. I do not know how many instances we have to sh we have to have to show you there is real psychological damage done to people particularly young people if they are constantly reading even if it is anonymous strangers tearing them down and i am in a unique place to talk about this because I, because of my media career and because of my exact time joining the media and the age I was and then the like the 20 years since, got a small taste of being a public figure pre-social media and then a large taste during the birth of social media, the ubiquitousness of it, and now... A large sample of since I have essentially logged off. Not from my own comments, but from reading any of yours. And I am here to tell you. It will absolutely impact and affect your real life relationships. How you view yourself the way you carry yourself, all of these things, because of what you are reading and seeing that is said about you. There is almost no way to become inoculated against it other than avoiding it. And what Angel Reese experienced, so when you think about what she said there, death threats, sexualized, all of those things. Honest question, how many of those things do you think happened in person? How many of those things do you think was someone coming up to her on the street and saying that to her? I understand you get heckled in person as an athlete, but athletes are great at dealing with that and sometimes you know, using that as fuel, I don't think that's what she's talking about. I think she's talking about through her goddamn phone. And I'm 
And I am here to tell you that there is no way to, you're not going to age out of that impacting you. You're not going to mature out of that impacting you. The only way to not allow that to be a sore on your soul is to not read it. And I know that is kind of counterintuitive to what ideally social media is there for. It's so you can interact with people. It's so people can leave comments. It's so I, I get all of that. But that is not what it is in practicality today, especially if you are a public figure. And I, we're not through the other side of this yet. We're still in the midst of it. But for young people out there that have any type of following, even if the following is just a lot of people at your high school or college follow you on Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is, I am here to tell you that that shit is toxic. Angel Reese reached the pinnacle, led her team to the national championship, was one of the best players in her sport, was on talk shows, Sports Illustrated, the swimsuit edition, the regular edition, made money, had got rich by certainly by college standards and maybe by anybody's standards. And she just said that in that time frame, she hasn't been happy. Because you can't run from that shit if you read it. And I'm here to tell you that one of the best decisions I ever made was stopping reading that stuff. Like this is, and it is, and I get sometimes annoyed by people who I actually interact with that then come to me and tell me, oh man, folks are killing you for X. No, they're fucking not. I mean, maybe they are on, on your phone, but in real life, you you better find me walking my dog or have my phone number or know me personally. Otherwise, I'm not hearing it. And that does make me a little sad because it me there are there's good. There are people that I probably would like to connect with or you know, big fans or whatever it is that I'm missing there them reaching out or their comments. But I, I can't wade through the toxicity to find those without having the toxicity pull me down. And so Angel Reese, like, I empathize with her and with every young person that becomes famous. Every single one. But I'm here to tell you the only way through is to decide that the dopamine kicks you get from the good comments will not outweigh the being dragged down by the bad. And I have seen folks in my field wreck their careers by being so captivated by their online audience. And curating their content to that or changing what they will or won't say or being afraid, all of it. it there's, it's, it's too many people. You're not going to please them all. And the more successful you get, the more people that will be there to try to ruin your day. And so I, I really, really wish that we did a better job preparing. I used to say you should be able to major in pro athlete when you went to college. 
Like, hey, people major in things all the time that they're not going to end up being, and people let them. It's like people majored in broadcast journalism at Syracuse that I think was pretty clear early on, you're not going to be a broadcaster. Nobody said you're not allowed to do it. People major in art history. You know, you can major in anything you want. And you should be able to major in pro athlete. And the classes would be things like contract law, public speaking, money management, the things you would need if you become a pro athlete. One of those things should be dealing with celebrity and how to deal with it and keep an even keel. Because we're not, we're not helping our, our, our folks out on that. And that dealing with celebrity thing is maybe something we could teach in high school to everyone because everyone is a different in, in today's day and age, almost everyone's some form of celebrity, just different levels of it. You, anybody that, that dips their toe into the content creation or social media or semi public figure waters is going to be susceptible to this stuff. And it it is, It makes me sick that Angel Reese basically just said this last year, which should have been the best year of her life, has been the worst. But that that is not like right now, if you go, I'm certain, to Angel Reese's social media, what people are doing, some people are doing is putting up pictures from her in the swimsuit issue and saying, oh, you're going to cry about being sexualized and all of a sudden put that on her. Twist it. They're going to put that on her and somewhere in her brain as a kid, as a 20-something year old, there's something and there's going to be like, oh, did I do that? Am I default? Should I not have done that? Should I? And it and it's, it's just not good for your mental health, y'all, flatly. And it's one of the reasons, Demonze, that I, especially right when we started and to a degree now, and try to be protect. You're 25. You're you're older, but it's still like I try to be. I I had to, and I still have to, kind of walk a fine line of how like big do I want your Twitter following to be? And I understand. I really should. I'm not trying to live your life for you. I apologize. I know that sounds patronizing. I don't mean it <laughs> to. Fine. But you're but you you're in this public figure world because of me. And so I feel, you know what I mean? There is a, the, there is a real, like, I just don't think it's good for people. Like, do you think, let me ask you before we move on. Do you think when people, cause I know you see some of them, or at least when we first started, you would read a lot of the comments. Did you feel it having an impact on you? Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely felt like, uh, it had me question a couple things, but it was, I think that I think that with most of them, I could just like kind of look at them and and laugh. Maybe like I was thinking something else in my head, but there were definitely a couple comments that I can remember that I, just made me sit there and like kind of think for a second. Um, and like maybe right, it that like still lasted remember. outside of that. Yeah, exactly, hundred percent. Yeah, that, that, well, he, it did last outside of it because you still remember it. It's yeah. still somewhere burrowed in your brain. Uh, because and and this is the last point, and I know I'm going long on this. This is the last point I'll make. Human beings are not wired to be under constant attack because in person, people aren't. Right. Like you in per- like pre-social media, the amount of times someone was cursed out by somebody in a year for most people would be around zero. Like how many times... Like uh, and, and even post social media, ask yourself how many awful interactions have I had with another human being this year in person? Don't count spouse, kids, brother, sister, mom, dad, family separate. How many awful like I hope you die? Like has anyone ever said that to you in person? Probably not. And so. Yeah. We're just psychologically, we're not, maybe we'll evolve to a place to where we're. Social media. Well, there's just so, there's just too many. It's just too many in in the, and so, all right, we can move on now. I apologize, Uh, Angel Reese. I was on the wrong side. No, 
the who was on the wrong side of things? Um, nothing. I I I I think that I thought a certain way about the the Angel Reese topic as well, and um, I further understand now. And um, oh, you thought that it was like crocodile tears? No, I like, did. I, like it, the, no, you you basically you kind of called me out without not even calling me out. But like she said something about her being sexualized, and I was like, she did the whole swimsuit thing, and that was the wrong side of it. Like I was just like. I was very surface level. Oh, she felt sexualized, but she did a shoot. But I, I, I get it. I get it. I was on the wrong side. Well, no. So, like, that is, I think that's where a lot of people's heads went. Like, what are you talking about? But, yeah, the, the, the next level to it is, like, you can be proud of your body. with right. a Sexualized, no, of, of I don't course. think, may, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think she means, like, people being like, you're hot. Right, I think and that's how I took is, it. People coming in right. and nasty. And my guess that, is... Pe- Right. People have I wouldn't be shocked if she had been sent like a deep fake picture of herself in a sex scene. You know what right. I mean? Like or you know what I mean? A Photoshop picture of her naked or the I mean, again, like I'm think about Demonze. Just think this is I'm a guy and I'm older and I again, I've kind of been through the social media wars, so to speak. So I right. I've, I've built up a bit of an armor. But think about the most offensive, and and it funniest might be one way to put it, but most offensive or most vulgar photoshops of me that I have shown you. You know what I mean? The, the things that were sent to about me yeah. with me. Sometimes Shannon Sharp's in them, uh, LeBron's. You know what? Those things. Lever. Those things right. that people on the internet create. Then imagine you're a young woman who they have the you know the pictures to choose from are your swimsuit pictures you know what i mean like that's the type of shit she's talking about and and so yeah i just it's a real thing that we don't yet have a full grasp on the real impact of it um all right by the way the lsu iowa rating i'm being told 12.2 million people what a number the national championship last year did 10 million. 12.2 million. Hold on. Let me just check something real quick. Uh 2023 NBA Finals ratings. I think they were like The 16, NBA Finals 18? last year averaged 11.6. Holy crap. Okay. Um well wait, hold on. Oh yeah, it averaged uh 11.6 last year. That LSU Iowa Elite Eight game did twelve point two, at least that's what I'm being told. That's a great, great number. All right, take a quick break. Come back, talk a little LeBron, Rasheed Rice, uh, my way to fix playoffs across sports. Do all that next. What's right? All right, welcome back in What's Right with Nick Wright, episode 226. All right, Demonze, uh, let's get back to hoops. Go ahead. Yeah, so LeBron broke the record for most 30-point games in a row. Or actually, no, not in a row, just 30-point games, sorry. And tied his career, career, yep. his career high in threes. After the game, he said that he doesn't have much time left. And you once said that LeBron wouldn't stick around in the league long enough to be a bad player. Uh, so, oh, wait, yeah. what did you mean by that? And how far can this mm-hmm. version of LeBron take the Lakers? All right, so what I mean by LeBron won't ever be a bad player is, so he had 40 points on 17 shots and only took six free throws. So that's never been done before in the history of the league. His true shooting percentage was over 100%. He's, right now this season, he has... His fifth highest career field goal percentage, his highest career three-point percentage, and his sixth highest career assist per game. So, is he peak LeBron? Obviously not. Is he better than he was last year? Yes. I, is I he... A, it, a guess. Go ahead. I think LeBron is probably working on threes way more than he's ever worked on them. Being at this 100%. stage his career. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that would be the smart thing, right? As yeah. his athleticism is declining and as the game is changing, try to improve in that area. I mean, right now he's shooting better from three than Kyrie, Steph, or Clay. Like, that's what he is for the season. 
He's at almost 42% from three. Now, I understand those guys are taking more threes and tougher threes. I get that. But the number is the number. And so, if th there was this idea that LeBron was going to be on this slow, you know, decline, but that isn't what's happened. He, he has rebounded a bit from last year. And if in year 21, he's what? The eighth best player in the league? What's he going to be at year 25 if he were to keep playing? The 20th best player? Like, I just, I because of his IQ, commitment to his body, and all-around game, we're never going to see a significant drop-off. And on the passing Jordan for 25-point game or for 30-point games, yes, LeBron's obviously played way, way, way more games, but he's also had way fewer games than Jordan with high field goal attempts. So, like, a career games with 25-plus field goal attempts, I think Jordan's got a few hundred more than LeBron. So, the I, I'm going to try to have a Jordan-LeBron thing, but this is, this is just a, another thing where, when we look at the record books, you're going to see LeBron's name at the top of everything, and Jordan's name either right behind LeBron or, for a lot of the other records, like all-time points, you know, 6th, 7th, 8th on the list. But... As far as how far can he take these Lakers, I so Demonze, let's do this. Healthy LeBron. Okay, let's assume he doesn't suffer an injury. Right. Give me the list of players that you would rather have for a playoff series starting right now. Nikola Jokic. So Jokic is a clear one. Yep. Giannis. Um are you not you're Giannis, not Giannis? with the fully I guess like you said fully healthy LeBron yeah, I, fully healthy Giannis I'm assuming or you said you did say yeah, right now so Giannis yeah no, no, so no. I'll put Jokic, yeah, yeah, the, Giannis, Jokic Giannis Jokic Giannis and I almost kind of I've got wanna another Ty Curry in LeBron but like I'm not uh sure I think Steph has shown more signs of aging this year than LeBron I'll put Luca ahead of him Luka, Luke's playing out of his one. mind yeah that's another one um, After that, I don't know. People ready to say SGA and his almost non-existent playoff experience, you'd rather have him than LeBron? I'm not. I think LeBron's still better than Durant. He's better than Booker. I know Booker scored 50 the other night. So, and then for a how, series, listen, the, a, a, how far that. can LeBron take the Lakers? The answer is probably until they play the Nuggets. But what I will also say is this. On the flip side of that, I think for the Lakers to have any real chance of a deep playoff run, they've got to get out of that nine seed. You can't play back-to-back -back elimination games just to get the opportunity to play the one seed. You just can't do it. And getting out of that nine seed, they're running out of time. They have 33 losses. The Pelicans have 30. The Suns have 31. The Kings have 31. There's only seven games left. So the Lakers probably got to go six and one the rest of the way to have a realistic shot of catching one of those teams. Now, I think they don't have the tiebreaker with Sacramento, so they're essentially three losses behind Sacramento. They do have the tiebreaker with Phoenix, so they're two losses behind Phoenix. I, If they get up to the eight line, can they make the conference finals again? Sure. I don't I don't think the Lakers have a well enough well enough rounded roster in today's NBA to go, you know, even with LeBron playing at this level and AD playing at this level to beat Denver or the best. Talks the about that Trey Young coming East. over there. I don't know if it's like I hate that I'm idea. Oh, I okay. hate that idea. I just don't think three star first of all, I don't think Trey's a winning player, but I don't think three stars is the I think the NBA right now is too deep with talent. I think you need a team that makes sense. I right. think you need a team that you know everybody no, knows role, their roles. The like role, Denver yeah. has, OKC has, Minnesota to their credit has, Boston has. Those teams, everybody is fits a very specific role. All right, next.
All right, so you pitched a pretty crazy idea on TV yesterday, and that would be yeah. uh, the top seeds in the playoffs picking their opponents. Uh, so pretend Adam Silver is listening and make your pitch. Well, it's the simplest idea ever. First of all, it would be a can't-miss television night, the night that you do pick your opponents. Second of all, it would totally eliminate This unique situation we have in the NBA right now where let's say that going into the final day of the season, the Sacramento Kings with no Malik Monk are locked into the six line. And in the seven, eight, nine, ten are Pelicans, Suns, Lakers, Warriors, meaning Two of those teams are going to be the seven and the eight. And the Kings, a battered, bruised Kings team, is the six line. And let's also say going into that final day of the season, Oklahoma City, Denver, and Minnesota are all tied, as they essentially are right now, a game between them, for the one seed. You really want a scenario where all three of those teams would rather lose than win? Would rather be the three seed than the one seed because you're getting Sacramento in round one as opposed to potentially having to deal with LeBron and AD or Katie and Booker or who like that's an absurdity where teams are tank would potentially try to lose games to game the opponent system. So there's that piece of it. And then there's in the East. Hey, congratulations, Boston. You won 65 games. You won the conference by 13 games. Guess what? Joel Embiid's your opponent in round one. Because Philly was such a disaster without him that they fell all the way to the play-in. And now you get Embiid in round one as opposed to (laughs) the, the Orlando Magic or the Indiana Pacers. Is that fair? Or should it be as simple as this? The one seed picks of all the teams that made the playoffs who they want to play. The two seed picks who's left, and then three and four, you know, three and, and would four seed is like a, a little, a hint of I don't want to say disrespect, but like I think that would yes. add a little beef to it, you know. But like healthy, a hundred percent. You guys called it us would out. add real yeah. beef, right. right? You you wanted us. You yeah. wanted us, now you've got us. Of course yeah. that would be a thing. And to, to a point to where I think certain teams would be like to try to avoid it, would like send their guy up there and be like, we're just going to draw a name out of the hat. But every name in the hat is the Sacramento Kings. <laughs> just like, let's just <laughs> yeah. ruffle around. Ah, oh, we drew the Kings. Ah, oh, damn. <laughs> like, I, I guess that's who we're going to play. And Yes. Uh, and, and so, of course... Oh, That should be a thing. Just like the... And I also think this should be a thing in the NFL. In the NFL, the team that gets the bye as the one seed after the wild card round should be able to look and say who they want. We want them. Like, we need to... But in the NBA more, because people are like, ah, the regular season doesn't matter. We should really incentivize teams going for it in the regular season. And so I, so that to me is an obvious one. All right. The last thing I need to talk about here is, is Rasheed Rice. So people are like, Nick, are you going to tweet about this? Nick, why aren't you talked about this? Okay. Which I guess proves I do see some of the comments because I saw that. Uh, So Rasheed Rice, the allegations are, and it appears to have compelling video that supports it, uh, that he, I think the story is, owns a Corvette, leased a Lamborghini SUV, and he and his buddies were racing those two cars uh, Saturday at, like, not even late night, it was daylight, Saturday around 6 p.m. in Dallas on the highway. There was a wreck, four other cars got involved, and then seemingly the drivers and passengers of the Lamborghini and the Corvette 
fled on foot. It sure looks like at least one one of the people in the car in the Lamborghini was Rasheed Rice. It has been reported the Corvette is leased in his name or he owns it, and the Lamborghini was rented in his name, which then creates a whole... Because the video shows everyone getting out of the Lamborghini on the passenger side. Now, there's a couple explanations for that. One is, because of the wreck, the driver's side door didn't open. The other one is, even in real time, they the folks in the car were like, eh, we want to be able to say none of us were driving, even though some of us had to be driving. Let's all get out on that side. Who knows what the rationale behind it is? Rasheed Rice in potentially a bunch of trouble. Can- uh, Kansas City Television Station reported yesterday that the Lamborghini was rented in his name, which means whatever insurance there is, he's the only one that's covered when he has it. So then you're in like a weird spot where it's like legally from a getting an actual trouble standard, it's really helpful if I wasn't the driver from not being tied up in lawsuits for the next, you know, until I'm on my third NFL contract, I kind of need to be the driver. So the whole thing is a mess. Folks are like, oh, Nick, what are you going to, what are you going to say? I'm going to say what I have always said about this type of thing. For the vast majority of us, the single most dangerous thing we do is drive. Most of us are not getting in fights. Most of us are not running with the bulls. Ice, you know, what deep sea fishing, you know, the what what was that show called? Uh Deadliest Catch. We're oh, not yeah. loggers. <laughs> we're not for most of us, we are in the most jeopardy when we're behind the wheel of a car, either because of how we're driving or how other people are driving. And being a foolish 20-something-year-old driving way too fast is about as reckless behavior as one can engage in. I don't know if he was under the influence or not, Because of the time of day, I'm going to assume not. But regardless, that obviously adds to it. But here is, and the reason I, and I think I made this point when the Henry Ruggs situation happened. Where obviously he was not the victim. Someone died. But I felt terribly for him. And we talked about it on this show. About how sick to my stomach I felt like. This guy got drunk and was, you know, driving 120 miles an hour. So anything can happen. The worst possible thing happened. Really the worst thing, which is he lived, someone else died, and now he's got that to live with, deal with the repercussions. Uh, But I felt sick for him because I think the majority of us, while maybe haven't done that exact thing, When we were young, we ever race a guy on the street? Maybe. Any of us ever had too much to drink and still got behind the wheel? If you drink, the answer to that question is probably yeah at some point. Like we are all, you know, kind of dancing through the raindrops, particularly in our 20s, of potential disaster. And here is the unfairness of the reality of how we as a society have decided to punish these cases. We do not penalize based on action. We penalize based on result. So, Rasheed Rice, if he did what he is accused of doing, absolutely could have killed somebody, could have incredibly injured people, could have killed himself, all of these things. Because the reporting is now, there were no, quote, significant injuries. What do I expect will happen? Not much. You could say that is prop, like unfair, whatever it is. We, we have collectively as a society decided we do not penalize reckless or drunk or race car driving, in, like race, not actual race car, you know what I mean. Based on the action, we penalize based on the impact. 
You can say that's right or that's wrong, but that's what it is. And so this would appear to me like Rasheed Rice might have gotten incredibly lucky here that the, the doing making all of the exact same choices, all of them, could be as simple as like how it impacts the rest of his life. The deciding factor could be did someone I've never met 20 minutes before I got into my car put their seatbelt on or not? Oh, they did? Well, now this is going to end up being a misdemeanor, uh, you know, community service situation versus I'm looking at prison. This is going to end up being a maybe one game league suspension versus I'm kicked out of the NFL. This is going to be, oh my gosh, what a scary moment versus the thing that you think about every night before you fall asleep and every morning when you wake up. All of your decisions, the exact same, and the difference is whether someone you'd never met put on a seatbelt, whether someone you'd never met you know, got on the highway at that exact moment or two seconds earlier. All of it is just left to chance. And that is a terrifying reality of life, but it also is, when it comes to this specific type of incident, how we as a society have decided to punish it. We we don't punish anything related to driving, intoxicated or not, Reckless driving based on decision-making, we do it based on impact. And, like, if Henry Ruggs, in his situation, everything was the exact same, but the person whose car he hit, they were totally fine, he's, I I, I don't even know if he spends a night in jail. Instead... It's years in jail. That person's like, and so it is, that's where we're at on like, you want my opinion on the Rasheed Rice thing. That's where it is. Um, I think he, it, it, you know, if the videos and stories are true, he made an incredibly reckless decision that put obviously a ton of people who he never met in jeopardy. And I think it's probably, I don't want to say going to get away with it, but like it's probably going to be pretty minor. That's what I think is going to happen. Should that be how we do it? Probably not. But then we have a real weird thing where if we don't do those things based on impact, then what do we want the penalty for drunk driving to be? Do we want the penalty for drunk driving to be? Well, you could have killed someone, so a DUI is mandatory five years and I by the way I don't even think Rashid was drunk but I'm just using that it's a weird that's like a whole different thought exercise here of how we want to handle those types of things should it be based on impact or based on action when it comes to things with our cars we have kind of decided it's based on impact and because of that I think he's gonna I think he's going to be okay I hope he learns from it and this is why driving is Like I said, the single scariest and most dangerous thing any of us do. Quick break, come back, play likely, maybe what if, and try to answer some of your questions. What's right? Demonze, I got I got some bad news. I think our producers might have got got that twelve point two million number that I said that I was told was the rating for the women's game. I I think they either misread something or it was fake news or something. I was surprised that rating would be out already. Uh, So I don't, so I apologize to the audience. If you think the 12, 12 million, I think is in play. It seemed high, but I think it's in play, but we'll see. But for the audience out there, uh, if you texted your friends that it was 12 million, you tried to cash in your, your bets on the rating, 
we gave you bad news. I, we gave you fake news. I apologize. So that, that number's not in yet. Uh, I do have, from a more reliable source, I do have the rating number for the men's game on Easter. The men's game's on Easter. Uh, Tennessee Seven Purdue did $10.4 million. Million. Oh. NC State Duke did $15 million. Um, And Colorado, Iowa. Was that the – hold on, Colorado, Iowa. Oh, that was the the Iowa women's game did seven million. If Colorado Iowa did seven million, then I then I think it's uh then it's I think it's play in play with LSU Iowa. Yeah, I think twelve million might be in play. All right, let's play. Let's quickly do this and then uh, answer some listener questions. Play a game of likely, maybe what if? Yes. All right. So we're starting off. Uh, something is not adding up in Cleveland. Uh, Cavs owner mm-hmm. Dan Gilbert said he thinks Donovan Mitchell will sign an extension, but Mitchell isn't talking like a player that's about to sign an extension. After a blowout in Denver, he said it's effing April. We've got to figure it out. Uh, what is Donovan Mitchell's future? Um, he's likely traded this summer. Maybe okay. he signs that extension. Or I guess the what if is what if the Cavs just hold on to him and then he potentially walks in a year. But I think he is the big-ticket guy that gets traded this summer, potentially to Philly. I'm sure he'd love to go to Miami. I don't. I think the Knicks are happy where they're at. Next. Okay, uh, Michael Penix Jr. wowed at his pro day, running a 4 4 6 and he has already been connected with half a dozen teams. What will Michael Penix's future or draft day look like? It likely... I think he's going to be, unfortunately, the sixth quarterback off the board. Caleb, Drake, J.J. McCarthy, Jaden Daniels, and weirdly, Bo Nix, I think, are going to go ahead of him. Um, Maybe if Penix is there at 13, which he should be, the Raiders take him. And then the what if is what if the Patriots trade out of three to acquire extra picks and then draft him with at the very top of round two. If the Patriots trade out of three for someone that wants J.J., I think that's the what if. I think more likely he is the sixth quarterback taken, which still could make him a first-round pick in this year's draft. All right, next. All right, so Zachary's draft stock has been skyrocketing, but many still question if mm-hmm. his size uh, his size and limitations will translate to the NBA. But the NBA still has referees, so he's probably got a chance. What will Edie's okay. career look like? I mean, a career backup is likely. Like a better version of Boban. And that's not a knock. Okay. Like, B- Boban's a great offensive player. I think Edie's a better offensive player. The problem for Boban is he just can't move. So he's just a terrible defender despite being how big he is. I think that's what Edie will be. I think he'll be a backup center uh, in the NBA. Maybe there is a team that wants to just go super. Like I saw Kevin O'Connor project that the Thunder could draft him and use Chet like as his defensive backstop and just have like this super giant team. Maybe. Maybe. And then the what if is, unfortunately, what if is Zach Eady's career is, you know, owning the most popular string of car dealerships in the greater Purdue area. Like, that's possible, too. Like, that he's a collegiate <laughs> legend, that it just doesn't tra- – like, a Purdue legend forever, but it just doesn't translate to the NBA. Like, that's on the board. Right. Uh, and so that you can be a great college player and not a great pro, particularly as the NBA is changing. All right, next. I'd get a car from Zach Eady. Um, so NC there State big man DJ Burns has got the town talking. Uh, even Jokic said he likes his game, of course. And now Schrager is reporting there could be an NFL interest due to his size and footwork. What is Burns' professional future? I think he'll try. I think he'll I try out for the. I think it's likely. He tries out for the NFL and maybe gets invited to a camp uh, and then ends up playing professional basketball overseas. That's the likely. Maybe uh, he just says, no, I have no interest in playing football and basketball player, and he just goes overseas. What if he's awesome at football? 
six right. eight, can move his feet, put on some weight, and go kick ass in the NFL. That would be great. I think that's unlikely, but I think it's on the board. All right, let's get to the listener questions. Uh, Dylan Mail says, uh, uh, for DeMonze's Diner Shades, are we thinking Gucci, Louis Vuitton, or Dior? Uh, I just, I, th- what, do you got a preference there, that? buddy? Um, they're, they're name brand, but so not designer. designer. I, I get it. I get it. Um, yeah, I'd probably have to go Gucci. Uh, actually, no, I'd have to go Louis Vuitton. Oh. I think Gucci's got something going on with it right now. I'm not sure. Oh, really? Oh, okay. I'll yeah. look into that. Uh, we might have an in at Versace. So the answer might Versace? be Versace. All right, Versace. Yeah, yeah we might. Wait, have, that I, I don't, that yeah, wasn't on the list. <laughs> he did, Demasi see. doesn't care. I mean, he, they, they'd be a gift. Um, um. So do I, Thomas Washington? How much? How, yeah, how much ahead. did Magic Johnson get paid his first deal? Uh, she's. Oh, he's talking about Caitlin Clark. Magic. She's the Magic Johnson of the WNBA. It's her job to build the brand, not the N- NBA, to subsidize it. Okay, that's Thomas Washington. You, I I understand that, but when Magic got drafted, the ABA had already folded. Magic wasn't making the equivalent of seventy grand in today's dollars. First of all, and second of all, you you can. It is not about the NBA subsidizing it. It is about whether or not the NBA and the WNBA collectively want to risk someone else parachuting in and stealing this moment. By acquiring the star power that college basketball has built up for him. It's not a charity. It's about business. And I think right now the WNBA is in a position and the NBA is partners with it to capitalize on the millions of people that are into these athletes that they got, you know, they were stars absent of the leagues. Um, the Go ahead. Let's do Tay Jones. Tay Jones, a question for Nick. What team should Spur, uh, should the Spurs look at as the blueprint on how to build around Wimby? Probably the Spurs on how they built around Duncan. Now, own. Duncan obviously had Robinson right when he got there. Just don't try to microwave it. Don't do what the Pelicans did with Anthony Davis and what the Cavs did with LeBron, which is recognize, oh, my God, he's so good as a rookie. Let's just go all in right now. Take the long view. There's a reason the Cavs and Pelicans were never able to build contenders around those g- great players. All right, last he's one, Demonte. Um, take uh, he's Ro- unbelievable. He's freaking crazy. Uh, Roan Charrington says Demonte knows he's indoors, right? Hey, man. Yeah, it's his new look. Demonte's going for a look. Uh, I I encouraged it. Demonte was unsure about wearing it today, but the problem was this: if the if you didn't stick with it then people were going to think that it wasn't a look. It was just that you were covering up a black eye or something. You got in a fight. So you that's had to be, stay committed to it. And I also think right, – that's a good point. Exactly right. Uh, I also <laughs> think it's a good look. He's tried out a bunch of different sunglasses that you get in the little spinny thing at Walgreens for 8 bucks, <laughs> and he's going to get some nice ones uh, when I see him in a week. Good job, everyone. Great show. See you guys on Coward Show in about 90 minutes and on my show at 3 Eastern. What's right? Hey, thanks for watching. If you're still here, do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button, then hit the bell so you can be notified when we have new episodes. After you've done that, one more favor. Go to your favorite audio platform of choice and subscribe there as well. Don't forget, we're live every Tuesday and Thursday, 10.30 a.m. Eastern-ish. 10.35, 10.40, it sometimes changes, but that's why you hit the bell. You hit the bell so you're notified. You subscribe so we can get to 200,000 followers. We're right around 150,000. We'd love to get to 200,000, get Demonze another plaque. So like, subscribe, rate, send a rating too. Do all that cool stuff. Thanks, guys.